I'll give people a chance to come back to their seats or exit the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 14 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Waters proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. I call Senator Seward. The motion that the world is rapidly warming and, unless emergency action is taken, it could reach 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures within the next decade, putting Australians at risk of more frequent and more intense heat waves, fires, droughts and floods, and in fact poses a risk to humanity. And as the was commented yesterday, this from the IPCC and the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, this is a code red for humanity. And for some of us, we have been saying this and urging action, campaigning for action for years. I personally have been campaigning for this for over 32 years with basically the same message. Climate change is coming. Climate change is happening. We risk everything on our planet through our inaction on the threat of climate change. And now we are facing the reality. Bushfires around Australia, bushfires in Northern Europe, bushfires in Northern America, floods, loss of rainfall. That's been happening in my home state in Western Australia, in the southwest of WA, for decades. You can see it step down. Yet what happens? No action. No action. This is, should be a time where this place comes together and shows leadership in the face of this massive crisis, the catastrophe that we face. As a species, we have threatened every species on this planet. It's not just about us, folks. This is about every species on this planet. The IPC6 assessment report is clear. Climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying. Climate change and its impacts are accelerating across the planet. Unless we make immediate and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the goal of limiting global warning warming to 1.5 degrees will be beyond our reach, and that is fast disappearing. The report sets out five new emission scenarios illustrating possible climate futures. It paints a terrifying picture for Australia, one that has been warned about for years. The intensity, the intensity frequency and duration of fire weather is projected to increase throughout Australia as global temperatures rise from 1.5 to 2 degrees and beyond, heat waves, floods and other extreme events will become more widespread. And if that doesn't break my heart already, my heart breaks further when you learn about what's going to happen to our oceans. There will be a further increase in marine heat waves, ocean acidity and ocean acidity in Australia. This poses severe challenges for our beautiful world-renowned marine ecosystems, including precious places like those in WA, Ningaloo and Shark Bay, places that we hold dear to our hearts in Western Australia. Scientists are virtually certain that, that global mean sea level will continue to rise over the 21st century. Even under the most ambitious cuts to emissions, the, ocean, the world's oceans will probably rise between 28 to 55 centimetres. But if emissions remain very Thank high, you. seas Senator will rise Seward, between 63. Time has expired. I now call Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise today to speak on this uh, matter of public urgency. 
Um, the MPU today warns of more intense heat waves, fires, droughts and floods. But I can tell you now what we are going to see more of is the despicable behaviour that we saw out the front of this building this morning. We're going to see more of this vandalism, criminal behaviour and terrorism. Yes, terrorism, Madam Acting Deputy President, because what these people are doing is terrorising employees who are just going about their daily jobs, doing their work and not expecting to have to be confronted by people bearing cans of paint, um, buckets of goodness knows what, um, supergluing themselves all over the place, um, made by the oil and gas industry, by the way. Um, these people should not have to expect to have this sort of terrorism perpetrated on them at their workplace. And we didn't just see it today. We saw it last week at the Department of the Environment, at the Department of Agriculture. Um, employees going about their daily work, working for the people of Australia, um, working for the government, being terrorised by these despicable bunches of people. And these people over here to my right condone this sort of behaviour. They don't only condone it, they encourage it. And they think it's a good thing. And some even choose to congratulate these terrorist groups for perpetrating this sort of behaviour. Um, um, Senator McMahon, thank you for taking your seat. And, and a point of order, I understand, Senator Seward. What is the point of order? These groups are not terrorist groups. Senator, and Senator, Senator McMahon Seward, is instilling is fear point. into the community. Senator it's Seward, outrageous. please resume your seat unless you're willing to articulate what it is that you are making a point of order on. Is it on relevance or another matter? Uh, the fact that Senator McMahon is labelling no, environment that groups is a debating as terrorist point. groups. Sorry, Senator Seward. I call Senator McMahon. Senator Seward, I use the word terrorist in the true meaning that they are terrorising. And that is exactly what they are doing. They are terrorising people, they're terrorising employees, they're terrorising people in this building, and they're terrorising the general public. So that is exactly what they are doing. They are inflicting fear and terror into the general public. So that is exactly what they're doing. Um, this government does take environmental change, climate change, warming, cooling, whatever is going on seriously. And we are committed to doing our part to fulfilling Australia's commitment. We are on track to not only meet our 2030 targets, but in fact exceed them. But let me say, and I think it's important that we do play our part in um, all types of pollution, whether it's emissions, whether it's plastics, uh, a whole range of uh, factors that are affecting our environment. We must play our part. But throughout history, the temperature of the earth is dictated by sunspot activity. We have no control over sunspot activity. There have been periods of the medieval warm period where the earth has warmed, there's been ice ages, and in fact a lot of scientists predict currently that we are heading into a period of low sunspot activity. So that doesn't take away from our, our obligations to play our part, but uh, it, it is certainly not that the temperature of the earth is completely controlled by carbon emissions. That, that is a falsehood. That is not a fact. Um, if we are serious about lowering our emissions, if we are really serious about, um, about Australia meeting our targets and exceeding our targets and lowering our emissions and still having reliable, affordable, dispatchable energy, then I... Um, I refer to Senator Lambie's question during question time, why are we not looking at nuclear power? Um, this has to be a consideration in our energy mix if we are to meet our targets and not destroy our economy and our way of life. And if we look at the developed nations around the world that have low emissions, um, countries like um, uh, countries in Europe, uh, the UK, America, um, they all have nuclear power as part of their energy mix. Um, in fact, uh, all of the developed countries that have low emissions footprints 
um, have either nuclear power in the energy mix or access to large hydro schemes. Um, so I, I would say that if we are serious about um, meeting and exceeding our targets, we should be looking at nuclear power. Uh, Canada, 15 per cent, UK and America, 20 per cent. Uh, we have abundance of fuel McMahon, here in Australia. Your time has expired. I now call Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much for the call. Well, I think, in a way, Senator McMahon's contribution really highlights, again, the failure of of all of us, really, to work out a way forward on how we deal with the issues that are raised in the IPCC report. I mean, it is with some sadness and despair, actually, that I have to give a speech today trying to argue about the need for change, the need to address climate change. This is the sixth report that clearly, uh, based on science, that clearly makes the case uh, for the urgent need for change, and yet, you know, here we are in this place. You know, leaders, all of us here, elected to do a job, and we still can't agree on the way forward. I mean, that has been the problem that has plagued this parliament for more than a decade. Uh, and meanwhile, the science keeps coming in, the evidence keeps coming in. Every summer we see the bushfires get worse. Every winter we watch the fires in the northern hemisphere get worse. The floods, the natural disasters that come and hit our shores, the plight of people in the Pacific, it's commonly understood, even the ACT resident climate denier today now with ministerial responsibility, kind of acknowledges that. I mean, this is the world that our children are growing up in. My children, who had to remain inside because the smoke was so thick in the ACT, we had the worst air pollution anywhere in the world about two years ago from the fires that were all around our borders. This is the world that my children are growing up in. They get it. Overwhelming majority of young people get it because they see and they've got a stake about what happens. And yet here we are, the leaders of the country from a political sense, and we're still working out what to do and whether to convince each other and pointing the finger. I mean, it's just devastating. I used to believe in good policy being made out of chambers like this. That's why I got into politics, to make a difference, to be part of the debate. I used to believe that governments could bring people together. They could show leadership and they could when they reach across the aisle and when they bring stakeholders together, make good policy in the national interest. And yet, for the past eight years, I've watched the politics of climate change get kicked across this, weaponised, and where there seems to be now, from the government's point of view, a moratorium on good policy. They're not even interested because it's about power. It's not about policy. It's not about the future. It's not about making sure the decisions we make today, which give us a fighting chance of making sure that our kids and our grandkids don't inherit a dying planet. It's not about that anymore. It's about power. It's about dealing with division and disagreement from within the government. Every time Labor has said, we will support you on this policy, one of your many different policies you've tried to get up before, let's pick the one that you used before you necked Malcolm Turnbull, when we reach across the chamber, not, it's not what we would have done, but it's a step in the right direction, 
What's the response? You get rid of the Prime Minister and completely walk away from it, and another two or three years is lost. Meanwhile, we get these reports that tell us you've got to act, and if you don't act, it's going to be a disaster. And then we just, the government just trots out with its three dot points that it's been using for the past few years. One, you know, our emissions have gone down. Two, Australia beats 2020 targets. Meet and beat, I think, is the language. And three, we committed to Paris and a flimsy commitment to 2050 as soon as possible or preferable. And that's the only answer we've got. I mean, surely we're better than this. You know, we have to convince people from here. I get that not everybody across Australia agrees with where the Greens are. A lot of people don't. The majority don't. So lecturing from that side doesn't work. So there has to be somewhere in the centre where people from your side and our side and their side can find some common place to deal with the disaster that this report clearly shows will happen if we don't do more. You know, and that's what the community expects from us. For those that don't believe, to engage with them, to understand their worries. I get that there's people worried about their economic future. What does it mean for them, for jobs, for their job, for their kids' job, for their livelihood? Change is hard. Leading change is hard. Being in government is hard. I get all that. But someone has to lead, and people expect the government to lead, the elected government of the day to lead, not to point the finger at everybody else and use slogans like technology, not taxes, and just keep saying it and saying it and hope that that is the message that gets through, but go deeper, convince people, talk to people, tell them what it's going to be like in their region when climate change, as outlined in this report, lands on their doorstep. But for the people in power now, they don't care. They'll be gone. It won't be Scott Morrison answering to people as fires and flood and drought change the way we live. It won't be him answering to that. It will be some other person, probably not in the parliament yet, who will be faced with explaining why there was a decade of lost opportunity from this government. It will be up to that person to explain to generations why the changes that are brought in then are going to be harder, where the lives are going to be harder, where livelihoods are going to be harder, because we didn't take the message seriously. If I have to listen to another government member saying, we take this seriously, we are acting, it's a load of rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. What they are doing is working out how to stay in power. And that is a disgrace when this is one of the biggest issues facing this country. You can pretend all you like that it's not coming, but the history books will show we were warned. We should have done something more. And it won't reflect well on this government, not that I think that will matter to them, because I don't think it does. It probably won't matter to Senator Roberts either, who's sort of smiling through this presentation. But it matters to people who want good policy in this country, who want to make sure that future generations have jobs, have livelihoods, compete in a global world. You know, that matters. And it matters to me that my kids and their kids thought that this generation tried to do something, more than tried, actually did something. And that's what motivates people to actually call for serious action on climate, because this report is damning. It is scary. And I know people will try and pass it off and go, oh, it's just another report. It's not true. I'm sure we'll have a presentation from Senator Roberts soon. But they've been right so far. And anyone who watches the floods, 
the fires, the natural disasters, crisscrossing between the northern and south southern hemisphere, knows it's true. And we should be better. We should be able to do something. And we should be able to work together to do it. It might not be exactly what we want, but we should do something more. And it should move beyond slogans and power and into actually doing the job that we've been elected to do, which is to look after not only people now, but generations into the future. And that's the big failure of this government Thank you. today. Senator Gallagher, uh, I now call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not a matter of urgency. Even the Greens motion says it could, the temperature could reach 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. So what? It does not say anywhere in that report from what I've been told, and I will be reading it, that it will. Senator Gallagher is completely wrong. This is not an emergency. Uh, not a matter of urgency. It does not show what will happen. It says what could happen. There is no empirical scientific evidence that backs this up. Science is decided not by emotions or whims or daughters saying that the smoke in the air, mummy, that must be climate change. That's not it. It's not decided by Senator Watt and Senator Wong having, a, having an all-out battle with the Greens this morning. And not once did anyone talk about the science. Not once that happened. Instead, they were talking about each other and who was going to get their votes off the climate alarmists. That's it. So we, have now, we are now at date 701, almost two years, since I challenged Senator Waters and Senator Di Natale in this place to provide the empirical scientific evidence that shows that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. I also challenged them at the same time, 701 days ago, to debate me on the science behind the climate alarm and also the corruption of climate science. Not once has she since presented any such evidence proving causation of human, uh, of human, climate, human induced climate change. Not once. I also challenged her almost 11 years ago in public. I've never seen a person move so quickly. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you. Why? Because like Extinction Rebellion damaging this parliament, they are down just spouting out emotion, fluff, nonsense. But it's emotionally ridden uh, nonsense. And that's what gets people in. So let's have a look at some facts. I've challenged the CSIRO to provide me with facts. In the course of three presentations from the CSIRO, the CSIRO said, has never admitted, has, has admitted that they have never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. Never. They have admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. Not unprecedented. They've happened before. And in fact, they've been four degrees warmer before. Not worried about 1.5. 1.5 would be beneficial to the planet and to human society. CSIRO thirdly cited papers that do not show the rate of temperature ri rise is unprecedented. When they couldn't prove that the temperature is unprecedented, they said the rate of temperature rise is. We've gone now nearly 26 years without any increase in temperature. Just normal cycles. Fourthly, the CSIRO relies not on science, on data, but on unvalidated models giving erroneous projections. Same as, this, as the IPCC that Senator Gallagher is, is uh, referring to. The CSIRO, and this is the clincher, has never quantified any specific impact from human carbon dioxide on climate. Never quantified it. They can't tell us what CO2 will do, what our carbon dioxide will do. But we've blown on our power bills a staggering $13 billion a year in additional costs on subsidies for climate change and so-called renewables. That is $1,300 per household. That is what is staggering. That is the catastrophe that's looming in this country because of gutless Liberal Nationals, dishonest Labor Party and ins insane Greens. That is the crisis we're facing. Thank you, Senator Roberts, and I call Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Miss Acting Deputy President. And I note my colleague, colleagues uh, like Senator McMahon, who have raised in this place today uh, the unlawful protests and the desecration of our national parliament by criminals earlier today. And I also note the shamefully vocal defence 
of those criminals mounted by the Greens in this very chamber. In fact, it almost leads me to channel Peter Costello in asking how do the Greens sleep while their prams are burning? Because this is a government that can walk and chew gum at the same time. Not only are we taking meaningful action on uh, the very real challenge of emissions reduction, which I'll get to in time, but we've also undertaken very significant reforms and important reforms to the Australian charities and not-for-profit sector to ensure that no organisation that hides behind the tax deductions and the legitimacy of the charitable status afforded to them undertakes and resources the sorts of profoundly illegal and offensive behaviour that those Greens over there support in this place today. But we've also heard criticism from the Labor Party today that you know, somehow achieving emissions reductions in real terms such that our emissions today are lower than they were in 1990, somehow achieving emissions reductions of 20 per cent on 2005 levels, somehow beating Japan, the United Kingdom, the United States and South Africa in achieving emissions reductions since 2005 isn't enough for them. And it would seem that the only thing they're looking for is job-destroying taxes, looking for blank cheques and meaningless inter international commitments. Well, this is a government that won't stand for that. We stand for ambitious action on climate change, but only where it can be met and supported by a clear plan, a costed plan, and one that supports Australian jobs. And that's why the Morrison government stands proudly behind its technology roadmap that supports uh, a lower carbon intensity future, not only for the Australian economy, but also for the rest of the world. Because the reality is that it, climate change and emissions reduction is a global problem. The developing world accounts for more than two-thirds of carbon emissions, and China alone accounts for more emissions than all of the OECD economies combined. Which is to say that Australia's 1.1% contribution to global emissions can't of itself solve this problem. But we have a very legitimate place at the global table when these matters are discussed because of our impressive track record uh, of actual emissions reduction and because of our ambition to reach net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. That, Madam Acting Deputy President, is a powerful message and one that resonates with the Australian people, the Australian people who enjoy jobs in the resources sector, who enjoy jobs in advanced manufacturing, who see opportunities that loom on the horizon as this government makes the investments in things like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, electric vehicle infrastructure and heavy vehicle efficiencies that those opposite joined up with the Greens to vote against. $192.5 million of money invested into renewable technologies, and those over there voted against it just six weeks ago in this very chamber. That exposes the hypocrisy and the baseless lies that are trotted out each day, and they contrast most starkly with the actions of a government that has not only achieved real emissions reduction, but achieved such a significant level of emissions reduction that we stand proudly at the forefront of the global effort on this issue. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Small. I call Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, for anyone who takes the time to look at the IPCC report released yesterday, uh, it is genuinely concerning reading. Uh, and in some respects, it simply repeats things that we have known for some time, uh, that we do face an extremely big challenge around climate change, but it is brought into stark relief when you look at the data uh, and the evidence that that report presents. Uh, in particular, the evidence in this report regarding the likely impact of climate change on our regions makes for very stark reading. And even if you just look at what it has to say about Northern Australia, one of the regions, uh, anyone who cares about the future of Northern Australia should 
really have pause for thought and should really be committing themselves to taking action. Just a couple of things that the report has to say about Northern Australia. It observes that Northern Australia has already seen a rise in annual rainfall and heavy rain events and that the region will face heavier rainfall in future. Uh, it, it, the report states uh, that heavy rainfall and river floods are projected to increase in Australia in the future. It has similar things to say about sea levels, coastal flooding, uh, about sea er shore erosion uh, and bushfires and cyclones as well. It is very clear from this report uh, that it is our regions in particular uh, which will bear the brunt of our failure collectively as a nation to take action on climate change. So for every LNP politician who likes to come in here and bang on about how much they care about the regions, they are actually betraying the regions. They are betraying regional Australians through their continued refusal to take action on climate change. Because when we see bushfires, they don't happen in the Sydney CBD. When we see cyclones, they don't happen in the Melbourne CBD. They don't happen on Collins Street. They happen in regional Australia. Bushfires, cyclones, floods overwhelmingly happen in regional Australia. It's our regions that are on the front line when it comes to the effects of climate change, and it's our regions who are being so grossly let down by a government that pretends to be on their side. Uh, what is the government doing to protect our regions from climate change? Well, the answer, as with so many other things, is nothing. This is a government, this is a Prime Minister that never takes responsibility, uh, whether it be for COVID, whether it be for bushfires uh, through the Black Summer, or now when we face this big climate change challenge. It's a government that is always slow to act. We saw the Prime Minister ignore repeatedly warnings and requests for meetings from fire chiefs before the Black Summer bushfires. All they wanted to do was come and warn him about the risks and encourage him to take action. He ignored them. He refused to meet with them, and we saw the devastating effects afterwards from this, this Prime Minister failing to take responsibility, failing to lead the nation and being slow, so slow to act. So this government's ongoing uh, ignorance of the risk of climate change, this government's ongoing refusal to take action on climate change is literally putting Australians at risk, especially in regional Australia. And at the same time, the government's refusal to take action on climate change is denying regional Australians opportunities, because there are opportunities that come for our regions if we take serious action on climate change. We are already seeing businesses around regional Australia come to grips with the challenge, adjust and, in fact, make money and create jobs out of this. Not that long ago, I was at the Sun Metals refinery in Townsville, one of the biggest energy users in Queensland, which is already progressively moving uh, its power sources to solar and it's on track to convert to, to um, uh, carbon neutral power in the next couple of decades. This is happening now. Companies are creating jobs in regional Australia about it, uh, through making this adjustment now. It's why people like the National Farmers Federation are on board for net zero emissions. It's why Rio Tinto, why BHP, why Santos, why Origin, why every big energy producer and consumer in the country is on board, and the only people who aren't on board are this government. This government because it doesn't take action on climate change, is literally chasing jobs out of regional Australia and into other countries' arms. I want to see these jobs created in places like Gladstone. I want to see them created in Rocky, in Townsville, in Darwin, in Cairns. I don't want to see them created overseas, but we need a government that is prepared to take action on climate change and grasp this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Watts. Uh, and I call Senator Faruqi remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's a code red for humanity. That's what the United Nations has called the IPCC's latest warning on climate. The world is heating faster. We're closer than ever to catastrophic change. And once we hit the tipping point, the climate dominoes will fall, threatening our very existence. The new IPCC report is our starkest warning yet. But the Prime Minister's lack of action on the climate emergency heralds the death sentence for our lands, our forests, our rivers, our oceans, and animals. There's literally not a second left to waste. It's not too late. 
If we heed the warning and take urgent action, we can still avoid the worst impacts. The report does make for grim reading though. The catastrophic floods and fires we're already living through will become the norm. Heavy rainfall and river floods are projected to worsen across Australasia. And the report warns the intensity, frequency and duration of bushfires will increase throughout Australia. Experts say that Australia needs to reduce our emissions by 75% by 2030 to avoid irreversible climate change. So at this time of climate collapse, where is Mr. Morrison and his government? They are busily fudging numbers and misleading people about our emissions. They are lobbying to override scientists as UNESCO, who recommend the Great Barrier Reef be lifted as endangered. They are doing dirty deals to dig up more dirty coal and gas with public money. You are the criminals, not the activists trying to save the planet and pushing you to take responsibility. And while the Liberals are burning through Australia's carbon budget at the risk of catastrophic climate damage, Labour is giving up on the climate action needed and is letting them off the hook. The alarm bells are ringing, yet both major parties have decided to look away. They've sold out to their pals and donors in the fossil fuel industry. And what a victory for the coal, oil and gas corporations in their race to stockpile profits while the planet burns. Being slaves to the coal barons is turning all our futures into ash. Millions of lives depend on our response to the climate crisis. Generations across the world will be deprived of the opportunity to live a dignified life if we don't act. So you are stealing their future right in front of their eyes. And they will have to live with the wretched reality of your inaction. Morrison and co are perpetrating an intergenerational theft so enormous it wouldn't be believable were we not witnessing it with our very own eyes. If there's no action, the report warns, we will hit 1.5 degrees C of global warming by 2030. Our forests will burn, sea levels will rise, rivers will dry up and also flood, our wildlife will suffer. Who has forgotten our last summer when deadly and tragic bushfires in our own backyard ravaged our forests and wildlife and consumed lives? These climate disasters will only intensify as the earth continues to heat up. I can barely contain my anger when I say that we're sick of you, Mr. Morrison. We're sick of your drivel. We are sick of your inaction. Do something, literally anything, Prime Minister, to turn back the clock on your criminal inaction. But you won't. So you and your lot need to be kicked out. And the Greens in shared power is the only way we'll get emergency action on the climate crisis. Thank you, Senator Perugia. I'll call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, for a party that clings to the idea of globalisation, open borders, no borders at all, just open up all the countries across the world, one world or whatever it is that you believe out on the fringes, they love to say Australia should open up. Whomever wants to come, whenever they want to come, no need to embrace our Australian culture. In fact, they openly and actively talk Australians down. But when it comes to climate, when it comes to climate change and the discussion around that, Australia can do it all and there's no need for any global response or participation by any other nation. There's no need for the rest of the world to participate at all. So whilst they sit idly by, and perhaps it's because they were superglued to something, they sit by as their ideologically aligned China continues to build more and more coal-fired power stations. But perhaps communist emissions don't count when it comes to this lot. Just don't see what other reason there could be. But here's the thing, guys. I'll let you in on a little secret. If we as a globe are going to tackle global emissions, it needs to be a global effort. I know that sounds crazy and way out there and just a little bit too much for you all to handle, but when we find ourselves in a position where half of the G20 member nations actually increased their emissions, all while Australia's fell faster than Canada, fell faster than New Zealand, Japan, Korea, fell faster than the United States. But yet, here we are, as you can contribute 
hot air, and pretty much that's it, to this current conversation. But you're well and truly keeping the current leader of the opposition company. As those opposite abandon their 2030 target, so in effect walking away from the Paris Agreement, when asked about this, the current leader of the opposition, all he could muster, and I really I, I do hope that I do this justice. Well, well what we do is in government, uh, of course, what we're doing is that we're encouraging the current government. I mean, um, thanks, I think. It seems to be hot air, indecision, paralysis, the beating of the leadership drum. I guess that in part could explain why just last week those opposite voted against the technology investment roadmap. They voted against technology. Because we know, for those opposite, it's purely about taxes and nothing else. Not for us on this side of the chamber. We're here for technology. We're looking to the future, investing in innovation, investing in our regions. I've personally been thrilled to see the $20 billion that's been invested by the Morrison government across the country up to 2030. And this $20 billion over the next decade will drive $80 billion of total public and private investment over the decade. And this investment will create around 160,000 new jobs. But yep, sure, you guys over, over the other side, you just keep on voting against those jobs and keep on voting against the jobs of those workers in the Hunter region as you walk away from the miners, but on top of that, walk away from the energy hub that the Hunter region is becoming, all as you continue to march to the drum of the inner city latte left. Not us on this side. We are looking at technology, not taxes. Not destroying jobs or imposing taxes and new costs on households, businesses, or industries. In fact, in the Hunter, we have organisations like Batmobile, Energy Renaissance, as the, energy, the region moves towards becoming a hydrogen hub, partnerships between industry and the University of Newcastle. So I thought I might take the time to explain to you what some of this investment looks like, what some of this innovation looks like, because I'm not quite sure the intellectual fortitude the depth of understanding exists for you to understand how some of these things look. Um, order. Senator Hughes, could you make your remarks through the chair and cease using the word you? Thank you. So, thank you, Chair. I apologise. And just as I explain a few things around some of the innovations that we have invested in, we all know Australia's resource sector is world class. And through the Morrison government's $1.3 billion modern manufacturing initiatives, we're actually helping to unlock enormous potential by providing targeted supports for projects that will deliver big re rewards for local economies, not only creating more jobs but generating export opportunities. So in July, we announced a grant of $4.5 million for Batmobile equipment in the Hunter to build heavy battery electric vehicles for underground hard rock mines. So this will deliver Australia's first commercially operational viable alternative fleet to a diesel fleet. This will catalyse the electrification of global hard rock mines and deliver emissions reduction as well as safety and productivity outcomes. One of my favourite organisations that's showing to itself to be so innovative throughout the Hunter region is an, a company called Energy Renaissance. And they've been working some great partnerships with the CSIRO, amongst others. But what they're demonstrating is that here in Australia, we have all the right skills and natural resources, expertise and an abundance of solar energy to create batteries and a renewables manufacturing hub. 
We know that the economic impact of COVID has created a greater urgency to build industries and create jobs and accelerate our economic recovery. An energy renaissance is seen as opportunity for battery manufacturing to take the lead in this. And they're building an exciting future where the world's powered by clean, stored energy everywhere. And they're building it right here in Australia. So back in 2017, Energy Renaissance announced that they'll develop Australia's first advanced lithium-ion battery manufacturing facility with funding from private investors and their foundation customers. They're continuing to work with the CSIRO and technology partner Cadenza Innovation as they're ramping up their capabilities and capacity to manufacture batteries in Australia that are safe, that are affordable, and they're actually optimised to perform in hot clients. Its supercells and super storage family of products are designed to perform in hot climates and be used to power infrastructure, buildings, businesses, homes, both in stationary and in transport applications. And I was absolutely thrilled to have visited the site twice just this year, including turning the first sod on what will be the lithium-ion battery manufacturing centre. This scale and anticipated market will see their export opportunities grow to an estimated contribution of around $3 billion per annum once our battery market is up and exporting across the world. Now, hydrogen hubs, something else that the Morrison government's focused on. And for those that don't understand, hydrogen is actually a zero emissions gas. But yet when we wanted to invest in the technology roadmap, when we wanted to look at technology, not taxes, those opposite were more upset about hydrogen than I think they were coal. I mean, I just don't understand what's wrong with you people. We know you don't like nuclear and won't put it back on the table at all. Senator Hughes, but can I just remind you about the inappropriate use of the word you in that context? Make your when those opposite the aren't very focused on looking at actual emissions uh, zero forms of technology, including things like nuclear, and understanding those opposites ideological opposition is long-standing, and it's nice to see that something's long-standing in their value proposition. But the fact that there is a continued opposition to hydrogen hubs, a net zero emissions gas, an opportunity for the region to develop jobs where we have plenty of natural resources. In fact, the great thing about hydrogen can actually contribute to our waste reduction. There's another company up in the Hunter looking to burn excess timber products, waste timber, and create hydrogen hub, generate more and more energy for that region. I mean, it's nice to think that at least from those opposite, we have one member, member for Hunter. Mr Fitzgibbon out there on his own, and he must be just thrilled listening to Senator Faruqi talking about a shared power arrangement. Can't wait to catch up with the member for Hunter for that one. Might have to expedite that membership form to him sooner rather than later. He's the only one opposite, I think, that still understands mining has a future thank in this you, country. Senator Hughes. Senator Sheldon, remotely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is very clear and it's clear about the impact of years of liberal national government inaction on climate policy is having on australia according to the ipcc australia has already warmed by 1.4 degrees celsius since 1910. heat extremes have increased cold extremes have decreased and these trends are projected to continue the frequency of extreme fire weather days has increased and the fire season has become longer at many, many locations around this country and around the world. The intensity, frequency and duration of fire weather events are projected to increase throughout Australia. And of course, we're already seeing the consequences of inaction on climate. We lived through the black summer bushfires, which ravaged so much of New South Wales and elsewhere around Australia. Months before the Black Summer bushfires, a group of 23 former fire chiefs and other emergency service leaders tried to meet with the Prime Minister to raise their concerns. And Mr Morrison refused to meet with them. And then as Australia burned, Mr Morrison went on holiday to Hawaii. As the bushfires continued to ravage Australia, he was finally forced to cut his holiday short 
And when he did return, he griped that he doesn't hold a hose, mate. Now, the verdict is in. The failure of the Morrison government and the Liberal National Party governments before it to take any action have condemned Australia to be future bushfire seasons like the Black Summer. It's a great, great shame. It's a great shame because as the world moves rapidly towards renewable energy, we have a once in a generation opportunity for Australia to jump ahead of the pack. Australia's abundant natural resources, wind, solar, hydrogen and gas, represent an incredible additional export opportunity for the Australian economy. A federal government which actually backs our local energy sector with investment and policy certainty could create thousands of good paying jobs while making power cheaper for homes and businesses alike. Now instead, we have the absurd situation, as the Australian Workers Union has highlighted, where Australians are paying more for our own gas than we charge customers overseas. This is the energy policy legacy of the Morrison government. Australia needs a government that gives the energy sector the policy certainty to invest. After eight years of Liberal government, we still don't know what their 2050 target is. Every state and territory government, Labor and Liberal alike, all leading businesses, industry and agricultural groups are all united in committing to net zero by at least 2050. Now, the only major organisation left in Australia opposing this position is the Morrison government. Without a target, the Morrison government does not have a plan. It is just floundering around. No answer for the real mine workers. And of course, they don't have any answer for, for coal mine workers either. You know, the Morrison government dares to pretend that it's looking out for them. While it comes to Canberra to pass legislation to support lighter hire firms who are driving down the paying conditions of mine workers. When it goes to uh, spending $300,000 supporting WorkPAC in the High Court on a case against one of their exploited casual employers. Truth is, the, Morris, the Morrison government is not on the side of mine workers. Mr Morrison and the rest of this sorry government are only here to represent themselves. The truth is that the world's climate emergency is Australia's job opportunity. Renewables, jobs are important to us to make sure that they work. Because quite clearly, we have an opportunity to turn around and engage nearly 27,000 extra workers expected by uh, the year uh, 45,000 by the year 2035. And yet the Liberal National Government has failed to give rights to those workers. It's one of the reports that talks about sharing the benefits with workers, not getting lower energy prices, and workers aren't getting the benefit talks about the, how the fact that these jobs Thank are insecure you, jobs Sheldon. because of the way they're arranged under this government. Your time's expired. I call Senator Thorpe remotely. Senator Thorpe, we seem to have a technical problem. Would you, can you make a rectification promptly? Senator Thorpe? Hey Lydia, hey, Lydia, you've got to exit the thing and come back in again. It, it, it's Senator, done that. You've got to close Senator it down Steel and open John, it again. You don't have the call. So, Senator Thorpe, can you attempt to speak again? Right. So, Senator Thorpe, you'll need to log out and log back in. In the meantime, I'll call Senator Steele John. Thank you, President. You know, hearing the latest climate report made and then listening uh, to, to the debate that has followed in this chamber today, uh, this avalanche of nonsense, this insulting, degrading bilge that has been spewed into this place for the last day. It leaves you frustrated. It leaves me furious, quite frankly. This report is crystal clear. It may be inconvenient to the major parties in this place who are funded 
by the perpetrators of the climate crisis, it may be inconvenient to face the reality that the people who fund your campaigns are destroying our planet. It may be inconvenient that the question before the Labour and the Liberal parties is whether they value the donations which drive their campaigns more than they value the lives and futures of the young people of this nation. But nevertheless, that is the truth laid bare by this report. It is a signpost at a crossroads, presenting us with a clear choice. It shows us very clearly that the climate crisis which we are now enduring is a creation of politics. It is a political creation with a political solution. The choice is invest in renewable energy, keep coal in the ground, keep gas in the ground, create those jobs in that renewable energy transition or continue doing what you are doing now, selling our future out in favour of those donations from the Woodsides, from the gas giants, from the Gina Reinhardt and the Twiggy Forests. Put them first, value their profit, and continue to sell young people down the river, destroying our future and condemning us to battle a climate apocalypse. It is our future as a generation that is on the line, and only the Greens are willing to advocate the reduction in emissions necessary to keep our planet safe, to guarantee a safe future for our generation as young people, and to have a, such a vital report as this, greeted by such hollow, Nonsense is a disgrace and a shame to this parliament, which should be taking swift and urgent action to address the climate crisis that is now our lived reality. The inability to do this is why so many young people are so deeply frustrated with Australian politics, why so many of us are absolutely disgusted and turned off with the major parties. It is why so many of us are looking for alternatives, why I'm so proud to say so many of us are supporting the Greens, and it is why so many of us will be working together in the lead up to the next election to ensure that the Greens are able to return to this place with more members among us and to be able to deliver for the community the climate action which is so urgently demanded and needed. Sorry. 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 I have to call you first, um, Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, in the interest of consistency with rulings made earlier in the day, could you please um, indicate whether you will be directing Senator Steele John to comply with the standing orders in relation to the um, refraining from putting posters and slogans into uh, what is in effect the chamber uh, when he is appearing via video link. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Steele John, to be consistent yeah, with I'm the still here. So, to be consistent with the a the ruling that has been um, made earlier today, um, when you next call and your next contribution to the Senate, we just need to ensure that there are no signs um, other than the other than the signs that you'd be able to have in the Senate. So, sorry, Pres. Could I just get or oh, acting, Pres? Could I just get some clarity on that? So, my understanding was you weren't allowed to have, you know. Labor or Liberal or those Sorry, kind of Senator signs. Sorry, Senator John, you're taking. Kindly, a... we've just got the we've just got the disabled and proud. Well, I, thing. I think I'm actually I... it's not brat like it's not. It's I not will a... um, to be consistent. Uh, 
on the ruling that was made earlier today, I would, I would think that the sign that's in there um, would not be a sign that would be allowed to be brought into the Senate, but I'm happy to ask the president to give you a, 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 a further ruling, if you would wish. I, I would I would wish that would you, uh, would you, just yes, on the grounds okay. that I, well, I would I'll refer only, it to only the because um, president for you only because as you can see it just as far as okay, you can see Senator, there it just says I've made that ruling I've made that yep. sorry Senator Still John I've made that ruling if you would like to continue your contribution on the urgency no I I've motion. finished okay I've thank finished. you thank you very much uh, thank uh, you thank you so Senator Thorpe can you hear me. I can hear you Great. loud and clear. Please can proceed. you hear me? Climate emergency, climate emergency, just checking. Is that yeah. okay? Yes, that's great. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We cannot separate climate justice from First Nations justice. But before I begin, I want to thank my colleague, Senator Waters, for bringing this important public urgency matter to this place and her staunch calls for climate action this morning. Last year, we watched this country burn as we experienced one of the worst bushfire seasons in our recorded history. The sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that First Nations knowledge is a vital tool in the struggle for climate justice. First Nations people have cared and protected our lands and waters, including our totems, for tens of thousands of years. But by disregarding traditional forms of land management, we've seen a breakdown of traditional forms of land preservation. Recent breakdowns of ecological systems and harms to biodiversity have been linked to a disregard of traditional forms of land management and their displacement by imported and harmful practices. You know, like when the colonisers came over the, on the boats and they destroyed everything they touched. The IPCC report acknowledges the contribution of First Nations people and First Nations scientists in helping record historical as well as current observations of a, claim, of a changing climate. The fir this First Nations science enables climate scientists to paint the whole picture and understand holistically what we're doing to the planet. We know that First Nations land management reduces the risk of catastrophic fire damage. We know that our land protectors out there play a crucial role in reducing the risk of wildfires and mitigating shifts in the fire season. We need to lead with what we know is most effective. We must put First Nations knowledge at the forefront of our climate action and policy to safeguard our country and the people that call this place home. Now is the time to build a better normal out of this crisis. Together we can change politics in this country, we can kick the Liberals out and put the Greens in balance of power. Greens in balance of power means that there is enough Greens in Parliament that the government needs to consult with to make laws. That way we can make laws that are good for people and our country. Because we know Lib Lab are pretty much the same these days, particularly when it comes to climate. In a balance of power, the Greens will push the next government to go harder and faster on climate change. And last time the Greens and Labor were in shared power, we passed laws to bring down pollution. Coal and gas are causing the greatest damage to people and we know that the Liberal and the Labor Party continue to take those dirty, dirty donations from the oil and gas companies that's why they won't talk about their target and that's why they're all talk and no action. We can continue to enjoy our lives in harmony with plenty of energy from clean sources like sun and wind. Or become a climate denier, a climate criminal or the climate terrorist that the, the previous senator spoke about. Senator Thorpe, your, your time peril. has expired. The question is, is that the urgency motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. 
Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Keep that there in case somebody asks me what the question is. You never know. Stop the bells. <laughs> The question is, is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion um, will pass to the right of the chair and those against to the left. I point oh, Senator Chisholm, is teller for the eyes, and Senator Davey, is teller for the nose.
I'm with you. The sixteen eyes and seventeen noes. Right. The result of the division is I sixteen, no seventeen, so the motion is negative. negative. So if senators could resume their seats or leave the chamber. So